Hi, welcome to this super space theory video. As always, I am recording outside, so I apologize for background noise. In this video, I'm going to be talking about super space theory from sort of a broad perspective and looking at how it answers certain questions of physics, cosmology, and geometry. So this will be a bit more of a reflection vlog video where I take a more casual conversational tone um, and try to show sort of the overall impact that the core principles of superspace theory will have when it is recognized. So to begin, I would like to... Um, Let's see if I have my GIMP here. Um, look at this um, equation, which is actually just shorthand. It's not actually math. S equals dx. And as I say in a previous short video, um, this basically simply means size equals distance at fundamentally smaller or the subatomic levels of physics. So this is stating that when we move inward, at some point we are not getting smaller, but when we move inward to the subatomic realms, we are not getting smaller, but moving in a fundamentally different fourth spatial direction into the fourth dimension. So that is the core principle of superspace theory. But there is a lot more to it, and we will be touching on that in this video. So let's close this down here. And I'll pull up some different pages that I have been looking at. Um, and so basically, what I would like to say here is that when I am describing the broader implications of superspace theory, including the core principle, but also the idea that when we see this fourth dimensional direction, we understand that there's this greater superspace, or what I call a block universe, where moving into the realms of the very small, we are actually moving into deeper fields of space. When we understand this, and this greater um, block universe, as a matter of fact, let me pull up one of my, my own graphics real quick, this alters more than just our understanding of the very small. It really alters our entire view of... Um, of space and time. And so here we see, if we look at it this way, that this is our own universe in a two-dimensional analogy, our own macro 3D space, but in a two-dimensional analogy. Then if moving into the realms of the very small is moving in a fundamentally different spatial direction of the fourth dimension, that means there are fields of space lying under or alongside our own 3D universe. And we will come to understand that subatomic realities exist within these deeper fields. And this is what gives them their characteristics. So in quantum field theory, we talk about particles as excitations and fields, I talk about them as holes or vortices within fields. But either way, we will come to understand that their nature is determined by the level or by the location of the field that they are a part of, moving inward in this fourth fundamental uh, spatial direction. But this means that there's this greater universe, so we have our own 3D space in a two-dimensional analogy, but there's this greater universe 
that I call the block universe, but can be simply called superspace. And the understanding of the direction of small as a fundamentally different fourth spatial direction or dimension is one part of it. But then once we start to understand this greater space that our universe is a part of, this adds context to all that we're observing, especially as we understand that moving inward, we're moving into more and more energetic dimensions as we move in this fourth dimensional direction that we think of as a very small, it becomes more and more energetic, but also that because the energy is moving through these fields, moving what we can think of as up through these fields, the energy is moving through these fields, this creates an overall motion of the block universe this way in the direction that the energy is moving and this is what we think of as time. So we can go over some of these concepts in more detail but these are some of the complexities that arise from this original shorthand equation that size equals distance at fundamentally smaller levels of physics. So the, let me go ahead and pull up a blank, um, a blank sheet. Actually, you know what? I think I have blank sheets here. Let's just do this. We'll delete a couple layers, start fresh. And so let's sort of take a very broad um, perspective from what I have already gone over. So let's posit that there is this fundamental energy without analyzing this for the time being. So there's this fundamental primordial energy. And now let's imagine that the only other quality or component of this picture of the universe. So here we have some sort of fundamental primordial energy, and then we would have some sort of fundamental entropy. So in my book, I speak of these as absolute motion and absolute stillness, or infinite stillness, but let's say absolute stillness, absolute motion. But you could see these simply as um, absolute energy and absolute entropy. Again, without trying to analyze these in the same way that there's always questions remaining in any theory, such as Big Bang Theory and the singularity, etc. There's always questions. But let's just start from this sort of proposition. Now imagine that this energy, by its very presence, has some sort of interaction with entropy. And this is sort of a creates a sort of boundary of interaction, which is, you could say, a field of space, or just a boundary, right? So now imagine this fundamental energy is moving against this boundary, and Again, without trying to get into the details of every one of these concepts, let's say that it is swirling around as it pushes up against this boundary. I believe that a spiral motion is simply the natural motion of something that is finding resistance but is still being able to move forward. So if there's no resistance, it simply goes forward. If there's too much resistance, it simply spreads out. But if it's able to move slowly, then I believe that a spiral motion is natural. That, again, is not particularly important, except we do see a lot of this in nature. But the point is that this energy is pushing up against the boundary, and at some point, it breaks through 
into or even creating a new field, a new field of space or simply a new boundary where the energy then, let's just make it swirl, spreads out within this next field, right? I know the graphics are terrible here. And then this happens again and again and again, moving from this most energetic field, this absolute energy, in the direction of the entropic. Let's just hold this as a possible picture and see how this would apply to our universe. So if this were the case, and let's now, having seen this, let's make it slightly more sophisticated, although with my skills, the, these images will never be very sophisticated, of course. But with what we just looked at, we now have this energy moving through progressive fields from the energetic to the entropic. It's hard, hard to write with my mouse. Okay, so the energy coming from this turbulent boundary bursts through. This could be a big bang and spreads. And as it spreads out, it's, you could say it softens. That would just be one way of looking at it, this um, new field. And so more energy is allowed to sort of pop through. And that's where my understanding of both the energetic fields within the quantum realm, within the, this quantum direction of what we think of as the very small, but in our universe too, as these become energized, even though there could be an initial Big Bang, energy is also coming through at other points. And this is where superspace theory differs from our understanding of the universe because instead of this being a closed system where no energy can be created or destroyed, energy does come through from the deeper realms. So this is an overall picture showing how what we see as the quantum realms, which are actually energies in deeper fields of space, to the heavenly bodies we see in our own field of space, this is our universe, are actually coming from this deepest field of energy and moving in the direction of the entropic and continually bringing energy in. So when we look at the quantum, we see all this mysterious energetic phenomena but even up here, we'll see massive um, magnetars or uh, various, um, you know, uh, quasars or whatever might be incredibly energetic phenomena. And because of our limited understanding, we're, we constantly refer to black holes as the one um, potential uh, reason why such energetic things could exist. But these could actually be white holes in the sense that they are actually bringing energy in. So this overall picture does alter a lot of things about the physics, our understanding of physics, and does actually match, I believe, what we are observing, even if our current theories would not agree with this. And if I can find it, I did actually have a brief clip, which I like to play some brief clips under um, fair use policy, just um, where um, someone is talking about 
specifically about white holes if I could find that, which I don't know that I'll be able to, but let me look. Okay, here we go, and let me make sure this is quiet because the volume tends to be louder. Okay, so let me just show a very brief clip here of this person's video. Raises a lot of questions. Where did the matter come from? Why can't any friends of them? How many drugs did you ingest before coming up with this Wonderful. theory? And since all of this remains just speculation, well, there are a lot of speculative answers to these questions. For example, white holes could exist at the singularity of a black hole, spewing out matter to create a smaller universe within the black hole. They also may be linked to black holes without actually being nested inside one another. Quantum mechanics, the no hiding theorem states that information cannot be changed or destroyed, but following certain models of the universe, quantum information would be genuinely lost when it entered a black hole. Rather than destroying the information, it's theorized that it may enter a black hole and then be ejected from. Okay, so you could just tell from this brief clip the complexity of these ideas and some of the interesting ideas people are coming up with. But if we just look at this picture right here, if you can see my mouse. Um, this right here, let me actually um, pull up my little gimpy gimp, and we'll uh, make that go away. Okay, so this picture where he's showing, um, and I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be at here. A black hole and a white hole sort of connected. This could be a picture. I'm not saying this is what he's saying. People sometimes misinterpret that I, I'm misinterpreting quantum physics. Maybe I have my own view on certain areas of quantum physics, but I'm often just saying how it could be interpreted rather than what they 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 are interpreting it as so I'm not I'm not um, trying to pretend that this is what he's saying I'm not um, but this is something that I believe so when we look at this picture the math of a black hole which talks about gravity curving inward to an infinite point but that infinite point as I've said in other videos when you talk about infinity it doesn't have to be a point it can be a direction. So this could actually be talking about, if I can find my Gimpy Gimp again, something curving into infinity with infinite energy within it, right? So the math of a black hole, which again does not actually t st state does not actually um, demand that we think of an infinite point. That's just because we think of things as points, as very small points. But that math could actually be talking about a hole in a field of space leading into infinity, which again I talk about how infinity is actually a direction. It does not end in a point. It's not an end point because it's infinity. It's a direction and this direction could be leading into infinite energy. And that's actually what we could be seeing in our math when we talk about black holes, certainly when we talk about white holes. Because the math is simply stating that the curvature becomes infinite. In other words, when it curves far enough, we reach inf an infinite infinity. I won't say an infinity point. We reach infinity, and that infinity is a new direction into the fourth spatial direction of the fourth dimension. I believe that this is what our math is telling us, and this is why when we um, deal with higher math, looking at, say for instance, um, a theory of everything trying to combine general relativity and quantum physics, um, 
we often have to deal with infinities, which is why, and I'm pulling up a bunch of stuff here because I have way too many pages open, um, but, and I want to do more on light at some point, but that's an incredibly complex um, idea, so, or, or you know, the whole concept of light is incredibly complex. But what I was going to say is when we deal with infinities, um, anyone who understands physics knows that physicists and mathematicians will use something called renormalization in order to tame these infinities so that they can do the math without having infin infinity pop up everywhere, especially when you're dealing with um, general relativity combining with quantum physics, because what it, you're talking about is the curvature moving into this infinite direction. But when we understand things in terms of superspace theory, we don't have to um, eliminate those infinities, as I talk about more in my, um, in my videos specifically about the math. Um, we don't have to eliminate them. We eliminate them, we just have to understand them as speaking of this fundamentally different direction. So things like renormalization and the Planck length, um, and I think Newton had something called the infinitesimal. But anyway, the Planck length, which is seen as the smallest length. And so uh, mathematicians will artificially end at this particular length, um, about this much the size of a proton. Um, these things all deal with the fact that um, we are not, not seeing, not understanding that these infinities speak as of a fundamentally different fourth spatial direction of the fourth dimension. When we see this, we don't have to eliminate them. So we can now begin to understand how, without having all of the details worked out, how superspace theory, from that original equation, um, that was from another video, that size, and I think I closed that down, but the original um, shorthand that size equals distance at fundamentally smaller levels of physics. Then realizing how that creates the notion of deeper fields, deeper fields of space lying alongside our own. Um, in the direction of what we think of as the very small and how this um, necessitates a greater multi-dimensional block universe and how as we move inward we move in this fourth spatial direction of the fourth dimension into more and more energetic realms and um, to actually continue with this idea this is what we're seeing when we are observing these immense energies within space, but um, not understanding they lie in deeper fields in the fourth spatial direction. So say, for instance, vacuum energy, which we do observe, and which um, is predicted by quantum physics, uh, this immense energy underlying space but we have trouble conceptualizing it because we see everything is happening here. I mean, this is 3D space, but in a two-dimensional analogy, it would be like we're, this is the deeper universe, the block universe, superspace, which has multiple dimensions, dimensional fields, but we're seeing everything is happening here. So obviously we're cons confused when we think about the cosmological constant versus uh, the predictions of quantum physics in terms of the uh, energy potential of the vacuum and the discrepancy there, it's because we're seeing everything is happening here instead of looking at the inward direction as a fourth spatial direction of the fourth dimension and understanding these vast energies exist in different dimensional fields. 
When we understand that, and again, I don't have all the details worked out, but this basic idea that size equals distance, that when we move inward, we're moving into fundamentally different dimensional fields where fundamental phenomena are located, and that this moves into deeper and deeper or into more and more energetic realms. These, these are some basic ideas, and they, I don't have to understand all of the intricacies of quantum physics for these to hold true, and they do hold true. And I think especially starting with that fundamental first principle that the inward direction is when we reach uh, fundamentally smaller levels or fundamentally different levels of the subatomic, that is a four, fundamentally different fourth spatial direction of a fourth dimension. And that principle will hold true and it will alter our entire understanding of physics in time. And that's all I want to say here. Thank you for watching the video.